To those who don't play, soccer is just another game with a ball. But to a player, any sort of player, good or bad, young or old, soccer is action and emotion. You run, jump, twist, turn, fall. You lose yourself in the game. And then you have the ball. You are in charge. But as he waits his turn to play, a boy will dream. Is it such a long way from his world to this one? This became Pelé's world when he was 17 years old, a world of which he was unchallenged master for 13 years, bringing to it flair and drama and a new brilliance. With passes like this, goals like this. Those were the years of Brazil's three world championships, 1957 through 1970. The years of Pelé, the man they called the king. Santos Football Club Stadium, where Pelé plays and trains, where he began his professional career in 1956. A career that was to make him a hero all over the world. The soccer player's player, total master of the game's skills. Skills such as ball juggling as a way of learning ball control. Dribbling, the most artistic and the most exciting of soccer skills. Shooting, the not-so-gentle art of scoring goals. Trapping, ways of bringing the moving ball under control. Heading, soccer's unique skill, using the head as a weapon. Vital link that makes team play possible. Fifteen ounces of leather and compressed air. A dead object? No, not really. Just resting, waiting for a signal from its master. And suddenly it's full of life, doing everything that Pelé wants it to. But even for Pelé, there was a time when the ball didn't always obey him. It was only hours of lonely practice as a boy that gave him this skill. Often, he had no real soccer ball to practice with. He had to make do with whatever he could, maybe a ball of old rags tied with string. Or sometimes, it was a grapefruit. 
Well, all right, but you don't see Pelé juggling a grapefruit or even a ball for minutes on end during a game. So what's the point of learning a skill that can never be used when it matters? Well, ball juggling is full of essential soccer skills. Learning to be two-footed, for instance. Pelé is naturally a right-footed player, but juggling helped him to develop control with his left foot. And concentration, learning to watch the ball closely. Balance. When your feet are busy controlling the ball, your arms must help with your balance. And juggling helps to develop touch, the ability to kick the ball gently or harder, just enough to make it go exactly where you want it. Juggling is a skill that you can practice on your own, anywhere, anytime. A private thing between you and the ball. Or it can be you and a friend. But however you do it, it'll be something that you learn and develop in your own way and your own style. This sort of practice is not just for young players, it's just as important for stars, too. Ball juggling will teach you to control the ball with almost any part of your body. You'll feel at ease with the ball. You can bring it to life, and you can make it do whatever you want. That confidence is the essential starting point for building up your soccer skills. Skills such as this, the most exciting, the most spectacular, the most difficult in soccer. Dribbling. The art of moving the ball past opponents while keeping it under close control. It doesn't come easily to any player because it isn't just one skill. It's many skills. Ball control, balance, speed, acceleration, body movement. Add to those confidence and experience and you begin to have some idea about dribbling. The ability to change direction suddenly, to move quickly to the left or the right, and to take the ball with you, is one of the basic skills of dribbling. The idea is to deceive your opponent. Make him think you're going one way, by a quick fake, a quick move of the leg, then take the ball the other way. Often it isn't necessary to play the ball. A sudden lunge of the body is enough to make the opponents move. Balance is the key to these moves. Watch how Pelé crouches over the ball, knees bent, so that his body is lowered. In this position, if Pelé does lose balance, he can recover quickly. Foot movements are another way of deceiving an opponent, of making him move the wrong way. Passing the foot over the ball, or as here in a Brazil versus Yugoslavia game, across it while on the run. Playing it from foot to foot, anything to throw your opponent off balance, to keep him guessing. Dribbling requires sensitive control of the ball. For most players, this means using the front part of the inside and the outside of the foot. 
But Pelé has his own dribbling style, in which he frequently plays the ball further back on his foot. It's not speed that counts in dribbling, so much as acceleration. The ability to change pace unexpectedly, to burst past an opponent with a sudden rush of speed. Sudden starts can beat opponents, and sudden stops can fool them too. <laughs> Dribbling is deception. It's trickery, really. Getting the ball past an opponent any way you can, and if you can't go left or right, then go through the middle. There goes Pelé, leaving a trail of bewildered opponents behind him and setting up a goal for his teammate. When dribbling, try to keep your body between an opponent and the ball. If he's on your left, play the ball with your right foot. If he's on your right, use your left. And don't dribble too long. You can't beat the other team all by yourself. And there goes the ball. There's a time to dribble and a time to pass. But really, there are no hard rules about dribbling. It's a very personal affair, and every player has his own style, his own way of doing it. Some are scrappy, always fighting for the ball. Some dribble with short steps. Others run with long strides. Some like to stop the ball. Some even make use of their arms. And with others, it looks like sheer determination. <laughs> then there are those still in search of a style. Of course, you can always learn from playing against someone who has a little more experience. But there is a limit. And as defenders all over the world have often thought, there's really only one way to stop a Pelé dribble. Soccer is a game of kicks. Kicks that come in all shapes, and sizes. Pelé shooting and scoring. Something he has done over 1,000 times. And this is the shot that has brought him most of those 1,000 goals. The instep drive. The hard shot on goal made with the hardest part of the foot, the instep. Kicking the middle of the ball to keep it low. That goal is only eight feet high. Kicking with the toes pointed down and the knee over the ball. Correct positioning of the support leg. Knee forward, foot alongside the ball and pointing at the target is vital for accuracy with the in-step drive. But shooting during a game usually means kicking a moving ball, shooting on the run, everything. 
placing the support foot, getting the body over the ball, the swing of the leg, performed at high speed. Another powerful goal-scoring shot is the volley, again made with the instep, but this time while the ball is in the air. And knee over the ball is again the key to keeping your shot low. In the 1970 World Cup game against Czechoslovakia, Pelé shows how it's done, with a ball bouncing directly ahead of him. On thousands of fields all over the world, millions of boys practice. And their aim is... this. It's the swing of the body into the ball and the sudden straightening of the knee that makes the side volley such a powerful shot. A ball traveling at over 70 miles an hour, it's perfect timing that gives a volley its speed and power. In shooting, kicking the ball hard is important. But what about those opponents who are there to prevent you from scoring? You have to outwit them. You want to get the ball into the net, but a straight hard shot is not always the best way to do it. The straight line can be bent to your purpose. You can often fool opponents by making the ball curve in flight, by giving it spin as you kick it. The banana shot can curve either way, depending on which part of the instep is used to make the kick. The outside of the instep curves it one way, while with the inside of the instep, the ball goes the other way. Rivellino in the 1970 World Cup, curving the ball viciously past the wall of Czechoslovakia defenders. That was Rivellino shooting with the inside of his left foot. The same left to right curve can be given to the ball by using the outside of the right foot. The ball is struck off center as the foot is swung across the ball. For the reverse curve, from right to left, use the inside of the right instep and kick across the right side of the ball. And again, that spinning ball. Changing direction suddenly means trouble for the goalie. Causing trouble for goalies has been the story of Pelé's career. He's found many ways to do it, but the most spectacular of all his shots is surely the bicycle kick. The bicycle kick. For a right-footed kick, the left leg leaves the ground first, then the right. A full swing up as the left leg now moves down. The knee snaps straight as the ball is kicked. Now back to earth, with both hands down to break his fall. Pelé seems almost to be calmly sitting down as he lands. Like pedaling in the air, it's the double leg movement that gives the bicycle kick its name. But it isn't easy. If there's a key to it, then it's learning how to land the right way, getting those hands down behind you. The bicycle kick. The instep drive. The front volley. The side volley. The half volley. The banana shot. Those are some of the different ways of shooting. And this is what shooting is for. And that is what brought fame to Edson Arantes do Nascimento, a poor boy from a small Brazilian village who became known all over the world as Pelé, the greatest goal scorer in the history of soccer.
Think about this for a moment. In a soccer game, there are 22 players, but only one ball. Your share of that ball will add up to only a few minutes in each game. That's all. So when a ball does come to you, make the most of it. Don't let it get away. Control it quickly and completely. However it comes to you, fast, slow, high, low, you must be able to stop it and not let it bounce away from you. The secret of trapping is to treat the ball gently, cushion it, relax the part of the body used so that it gives slightly as it meets the ball. The most frequently used trap is made with the inside of the foot. The foot is turned out and raised about two inches off the ground to meet the center of the ball. It's not necessary to stop the ball dead. Redirecting it, but still keeping it close to you, Turning with the ball saves time and can deceive opponents. The outside of the foot can be used for trapping too, or the sole of the foot for a ball coming straight towards you. A dropping ball can be controlled by using the instep. If the ball is correctly cushioned, it looks like a catch made with a foot. Even when you're moving, trapping is a gentle art. The ball must be taken in stride and pushed ahead of you, but not too hard. Again, it can be done with the inside of the foot or the outside. Trapping is not just for the feet. The whole body must be ready to control the ball. A dropping ball, for instance, can be trapped with a thigh, drawing the leg away as the ball hits. For a higher ball, the chest is used, leaning back, relaxing as the ball strikes, making it bounce gently up and then to the ground where you can control it for your next move. Using the chest to trap on the run may mean leaning back to receive the ball or it may mean leaning forward over the ball. A ball at head height does not have to be headed away. If there are no opponents to challenge you for it, it can be controlled with a head trap. Drawing the head back as the ball makes contact. This gives a moment's control, allowing you to pass the ball more accurately with your head or to drop it to your feet. When the ball takes odd bounces, you have to use whatever part of your body you can to trap it. Be ready to use your shins, especially on bumpy grounds. your stomach or whatever you can get in the way. is something special to soccer. In all other sports, baseball, basketball, golf or tennis, handball or football, if the ball comes at your head, you use your hands or a racket or you duck. Only in soccer is the head used as a weapon to strike the ball. Brazil against Italy, the 1970 World Cup final. Rivellino to Pelé, a leap. Learning to head like this starts with learning not to be afraid of the ball, not to panic when it comes flying into your face.
It won't hurt if you follow Pelé's advice. Hit with the forehead. Eyes open, mouth closed. Forehead. Eyes open, mouth closed. As a confidence builder, throw the ball onto your forehead. Start softly, then harder and harder. Neck muscles stiff. As you get the hang of it, start thrusting your head forward to meet the ball. A few seconds and you'll see that it's all quite painless. So it doesn't hurt. You're ready to head the moving ball. Gently at first, a pair of you bouncing the ball back and forth. Body relaxed, knees bent, twisting and moving to keep underneath the ball. Don't head the ball hard. You're not trying to beat the other player. Just see how long the two of you can keep that ball up there. Swinging the body from the waist is what puts power into headers. A sharp, almost vicious swing. The body becomes a catapult, pulled backwards, then suddenly released, and away goes the ball with the speed of a bullet. Hate the ball. Hit it with all you've got. Punch it hard with your forehead. In soccer, everything moves. The players are in motion all the time. The ball never stops rolling and flying and bouncing all over the field. Here they meet. A moving player, a flying ball. Heading on the run. And that means running backwards as well as running forwards. And it means running or shuffling sideways, too. All the time, hitting the ball with the center of the forehead. Balance. Only if you're lightly perched on your toes can you stretch for the ball without stumbling. When the ball is above your head, take off. Go up to meet it. There's the swing of the body in midair. A jackknife spring forward as the head smacks into the ball. Effortless. Or is it? This way it doesn't look so easy, because it isn't easy at all. There are a lot of things to coordinate. The swing of the body, balance, neck movement as the ball is hit, the direction of the header. The mark of the master is to time them all perfectly. Like we said, it's more difficult than it looks. May we see that again, please? The diving header. Spectacular and acrobatic. There are, unfortunately, always those opponents around to make life difficult. They want the ball just as much as you do. And when you go up to head it, chances are there'll be an opponent, or two, or even three, right up there with you. The result, a mid-air battle for the ball. But it's not always the tallest man who wins. Pelé is not tall, but he is tough to beat in the air. Partly this is strength, a strong leap from powerful legs, but partly it is timing. The secret is to jump early. Ideally, a fraction of a second before your opponent. Dangling eight feet up, three practice balls. Targets for the Santos players at a training session.
And even when it comes to jumping, a soccer player must learn to be two-footed. First the left, then the right, then both together. Santos Football Club, 1972. Pelé was a boy of 16 when he first played for Santos in 1956. He stayed with Santos throughout his career, as his fame grew, as he became the greatest player in the history of soccer. From his first game, Pelé was a star. And more than that, he was a team player. Because he knew he was only one man out of 11, sharing one aim, to get that ball into the opponent's goal. One man alone cannot do it. All have to help by playing not for themselves, but for the team. Helping each other, thinking for each other. No player can do very much by himself. Afonsinho, a pass to Carlos Alberto, to Roberto Carlos. Back to Afonsinho. Eleven men sharing one ball, passing it, never hanging on to it for too long, always giving it to the man who needs it. Passing. It's like an invisible thread linking the players together in precise and beautiful patterns. A skill that helps to transform 11 men into a team. Passing is the art of moving the ball from one player to another. And there are quite a few ways of doing this by using the different parts of the foot, the inside or the outside or the instep, or by making the passes high or low, fast or slow. Hitting the center of the ball with a large flat area of the inside of the foot gives accurate control of the direction of the pass. And passes that don't go where they're supposed to go are worse than no passes. Support foot, pointing where the pass is to go, alongside the ball. Kicking foot, turned outwards with a flat inside area facing forward, raised about two inches off the ground. A short backswing, and the ball is pushed firmly along the ground. Accuracy, that's what inside of the foot passing is all about. Even though the pass does not have the power of the instep kicks, if it's hit just right, the ball will move quickly and will keep rolling over quite long distances. Another type of pass, one that's almost a trademark of Brazilian-style soccer, is made with the outside of the foot, this area here. The kicking action is like a normal running stride. The ball is kicked forwards or sideways just before the foot touches the ground. Often it's more of a flick than a kick, and it's an ideal way to start a wall pass, soccer's name for the give and go. A flick, and Pele runs around the defender to receive the quick return pass. Against Yugoslavia in 1971, in his last game for Brazil, Pele gets past the defender with a perfect wall pass. This time, Pelé is the wall, and he makes the return pass. Now a wall pass started with an inside of the foot pass. One, two, three. The quick one, two, three pattern of the wall pass is one way of moving the ball past an opponent. Another way is to chip it over his head. Yeah. 
Pelé chips by jabbing his foot under the ball like a wedge, making it rise steeply over the opponent's head. His leg action is almost entirely from the knee, with no follow-through. Jab hard. If you don't, this may happen. For long high passes, it's the lofted instep kick, with a foot hitting the bottom half of the ball. Support foot slightly behind the ball. Body leaning back. Full follow through. Kicking with the outside, or, as here, the inside of the instep, makes the pass curve in the air. Gerson for Brazil in the 1970 World Cup final wrecks the Italian defense with a perfect 50-yard pass. Then there are moments like this. Suddenly, for a second, your man is free. He wants the ball quickly. Hit it low and hard with an instep drive. Exactly as in shooting. The instep drive, knee over the ball, body leaning forward. But passing is a lot more than just kicking. It's thinking, deciding who to pass to, knowing the exact moment when to pass. And the passer has to make these decisions quickly. If he hesitates, he may find he no longer has the ball. Pelé in action, without the ball, but watching the action around the ball, watching the players near him, glancing at teammates as well as opponents. Those rapid glances tell Pelé who is where. They help him decide his next move, so that when he gets the ball, he can make a quick, accurate pass, almost without looking. The receiver must be thinking ahead, too, running into an open space before Pelé makes his pass. Here, Pelé is the receiver, and it's his sudden break that triggers the pass. This movement without the ball is an unsung part of soccer. It means a lot of running, and often it has to be done with no result. The ball goes to an opponent or is passed to someone else, but it has to be done. Here's Pelé calling for a pass, running for it, but the goalie is there first. That's the receiver's job, to dart into positions where, for a precious second or two, he is free of opponents. Here, Pelé, closely guarded, needs help if he's to pass the ball. If his teammates don't try to break away from their opponents, then he cannot complete a pass because of the danger of interception. But as soon as a receiver breaks clear, Pelé can pass. With no teammates to pass to, things can go wrong, even for Pelé. A good pass should not only be accurate, straight to the receiver, like threading a needle, and out of reach of opponents. It should arrive at the right speed, be correctly paced, so the receiver can control it easily. The 1970 World Cup and two beautifully paced passes by Pelé that led to goals for Brazil. First against England, Pelé, a soft, short pass to Jairzinho. And in the final against Italy, Pelé's pass is so perfect that Carlos Alberto doesn't even break stride as he crashes the ball into the net. Brazil are world champions again, taking the World Cup for the third time. A moment of glory, 
but a moment that hides the years of practice. The road to the World Cup begins in practice sessions like these. Pass to who you like, but keep the ball away from that man in the middle. This is the way it is in real games. Always an opponent worrying you, running at you, never giving you time. This is practice under pressure. The passes are all here, inside of the foot, outside of the foot. Passes along the ground, passes in the air. And because of that always hungry man in the middle, they have to be accurate and they have to be properly paced. In soccer, it's the surprise move that often pays off. A sudden pass backwards with the heel, made by stepping over the ball. Or the crossover heel pass, made by crossing one leg in front of the other. Pelé has a number of these unusual passes. The shoulder pass, like a reverse shoulder trap, swinging the body into the ball instead of drawing it away. And the thigh pass, striking the ball with the flat front part of the thigh. A little lower, and it's a knee pass. Even the toe can come in useful for a ball that's only just within reach. The toe, the shoulder, the thigh, the knee. These are not passes that Pelé uses in every game, but he's mastered and perfected them all. There's a saying, soccer is played with the feet, not the mouth. But don't you believe it. A soccer field is never a quiet place. There are yells of encouragement, shouts of advice, maybe some criticism, warnings, demands for a pass, a constant crackle of signals flashing all over the field. But before you shout, look and make sure you've moved into clear space. Then the pass can be made with the inside of the foot, the outside, a short chip, a long instep pass, a heel pass, all accurately and properly paced. Obviously, no penalty kick should be aimed at the center of the goal. That territory belongs to the goalkeeper. The sticks with the red flags are two yards in from the goalposts. That is the area to aim for. Now, if you can get the ball in the one yard of space between the yellow stick and the post, you should score every time. A penalty kick should mean a goal. Penalty. Pelé is knocked down. But this time, it's his Santos teammate Pepe who demonstrates the art of scoring from a penalty kick. penalty kick is a one-on-one -on -one situation. There is only the goalkeeper to beat. But things are not so straightforward on a direct free kick just outside the penalty area. There will be a wall of defenders blocking most of the goal. beat them, the ball has to be curved. One way is over their heads. An 
another way is around the side, as Rivellino does here against Czechoslovakia. A free kick is one of soccer's rare opportunities for a planned play, a bit of rehearsed fakery to keep opponents guessing. When more than one player runs at the ball, which one will take the kick? Confusion can be a weapon, as Romania found out in the 1970 World Cup. Rivellino is fouled, free kick to Brazil. Tastao runs, but Pelé kicks. The last line of the soccer defense is the odd man out, the goalkeeper. The one player who can, who must use his hands. He has to be an acrobat. He has to be fearless. And occasionally, he has to be lucky. But above all, he must be able to catch the ball cleanly. The hands should be slightly behind the ball, fingers spread wide, and the wrists relaxed, giving slightly as the ball is caught. The technique is the same for a high ball to the right, or to the left, or in front. Whenever possible, the hands should be backed up with part of the body. For chest high shots, the ball is trapped against the chest and clutched securely with both hands. If the ball is bouncing up, lean over it still clasping it against the chest. Ground balls, even slow ones, must be treated carefully. Get down to them with the legs backing up the hands. For ground balls coming in fast to either side, a sideways fall is used. And again, the ball is clasped to the chest. When the ball is high in the air, the goalie must jump for it, taking it at full stretch above the opponents. can't be certain of catching it, then he must punch it away with one fist or two. But the punch must be hard and up. The diving save, a spectacular mid-air catch, creates a problem for the goalie. How to avoid losing the ball when he lands? He must bring his arms down quickly as soon as the ball is caught so that the ball and his forearms hit the ground first. If the ball can't be caught, if it's going too fast or is barely within reach, it must be deflected wide of the goal. The open palm is used. A light touch, just enough to redirect the ball past the post. is dropping into the goal, the palm is used to scoop it over the bar. A goalie's job is not entirely defensive. Once he has the ball, he is the one who begins the next attack. He can punt the ball downfield, this is good for distance, but not quite so good for accuracy in finding a teammate. 
or he can roll it out to a nearby defender. If he wants to pass it quickly, he can throw it. But the most usual way is to lob the ball. This gets the ball over the head of nearby opponents and gives good distance and accuracy. Alongside all of its skill and its artistry, soccer has its hard side. Being a soccer player means having the stamina to give your best throughout a game. It means putting up with your share of knocks and bumps. It means being in shape, and it means training to stay in shape. Santos Stadium, the crowds and the noise come on Sunday afternoon or at night under the floodlights. Early in the morning, it's strangely quiet and empty, but there's action going on just the same. 9.30 a.m., a group of Santos players leaving the locker room for a practice session. Next to Pelé is Baba, one of the Santos junior players who live in a dormitory at the stadium. Before the real physical preparation begins, there's a warm-up session. When the warming up is over, the players begin a series of exercises arranged as a circuit around the field. A soccer player has to be an all-around athlete. He needs speed along with endurance, power as much as flexibility. Each of the exercises, or stations of the circuit, is designed to strengthen different parts of the body to sharpen different skills. This particular circuit was devised by Professor Giulio Mazzei, the Brazilian physical preparation expert who has worked closely with Pelé for many years as both teacher and friend. Here at station one, the leg muscles are developed for sudden direction changes, the sort of thing that a good dribbler must be able to do. Balance is crucial to so many things in soccer, and balance means continually adjusting the position of the top half of your body to rapid leg movements. Much of this adjustment is performed by the muscles of the stomach area. Station two is the first of four exercises designed to strengthen these abdominal muscles. Station three is an exercise for developing the proper running position. The spaces between the sticks can be increased to exaggerate the running stride. And in exaggeration, balance becomes increasingly important. The muscles of the calf and the front of the thigh do most of the work here. The abdominal muscles again at station four. Working in pairs, one player helping the other, then repeating the exercise after exchanging positions. Not all the running in soccer is done forwards, or even backwards. There is a great deal of lateral movement, the sort of thing that is being practiced here at Station 5. Sticks are used again. This time there are two rows, with the players shuffling sideways between them, first one way, then the other. Station six strengthens the upper and lower parts of the main abdominal muscle. The pairs all keep to the same rhythm, something that helps to develop the idea of team play, of each player working in unison with all the others. A variation of lateral movement, jumping sideways, pushing off with the right foot, then the left, then repeating the exercise with both feet together. A zigzag pattern from hoop to hoop. Station 7 strengthens the muscles used in jumping and provides a new set of movements that develop dynamic balance, balance while in motion. Up. 
the last of the abdominal exercises. This time, it's the two side muscles that are developed by the rhythmic twisting movement. Like all the abdominal exercises, station eight increases the flexibility of the spine. This permits a wider range of upper body movement, something that is essential in heading, for example. Jumping is again important at station nine, but there's more to it than just getting over the bars. The hurdles are of different heights, and the idea is for the players to just clear each bar, high or low. This way, they learn to use only the precise amount of energy required to do the job. They don't make a strenuous high leap over a low bar. Energy is not wasted, and that's very important for a player who's out on the field for 90 minutes. And those players ducking underneath aren't cheating. Lowering the body is part of the exercise, too. The hurdles are spaced so that some takeoffs have to be made with the right foot and some with the left, and some must be made with both feet. The vaulting horse at station 10 presents a double obstacle. The player must get over it, and then, as he hits the ground on the other side, before he has fully regained his balance, he must immediately begin a 10-yard sprint. Station 11, and a typical piece of soccer action that brings together many of the things that physical preparation is designed to develop. Jumping ability, timing, balance, strong stomach muscles to jackknife the body in midair. And look at the way the arms are used to help propel the body upwards. Station 11 is the last in this circuit. Other circuits may have more or fewer stations or may use different exercises. What is suitable training for Pelé, who plays 90 games a year, mostly in a hot climate, may not be right for other conditions and other players. The exact composition of the circuit is a matter for each coach to decide. Pelé's soccer career has been one memorable moment after another. Famous games, famous plays, famous goals. They stretch back for over 15 years. But two of those years stand out in Pelé's memory. Mexico, July 1970. Pelé's brilliant play inspired Brazil to their World Cup victory, winning the trophy for the third time. No other nation had ever done that. And then July 1971. Fica, Fica, stay, stay. The chant from 125,000 voices filled Rio's huge Maracanã Stadium as Pelé slowly jogged around the field after playing his last game for Brazil. Cheers, but sadness too. An era was coming to an end.